Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth, and this will be the next video in the series reviewing Leighton Flowers' classroom session entitled Tiptoeing Through Tulip. We've finally gotten to the P of Tulip, the perseverance of the saints, and we're going to see what Leighton Flowers is going to do with it. So without any further ado, let's get into this. Let's go to the P, Perseverance of the Saints. This is another one, Southern Baptist. Once saved, always saved. Right? That's what we as Southern Baptists have held to and, and, and pride ourselves on this. And that's what many people think Calvinism is really all about. And as you can see from these earlier points, it, it really is not our major point of contention. We also affirm the Perseverance of the Saints. But I've changed Perseverance of the Saints to what I think is a better biblical word um, with the letter P. And that is predestination. Predestination is a huge word within this debate. And I affirm predestination. But the question is, what is predestination talking about? Does that make sense? All right, just wanted to jump in there before we got too far into it. So he's already come out and said, you know, this isn't our major point of contention. We as Southern Baptist traditionalists, we believe in once saved, always saved. Um, that is actually not the Reformed Calvinistic position. Our position is that there is such a thing as false conversion. And we also have a doctrine of assurance as well. You don't find those in the Southern Baptist uh, traditionalist system. And it's basically, you get your ticket punched, you're going to heaven. It's a done deal. There is no, you know, there's no worthwhile introspection on that one. You know, if it, you started the process, you're going to end the process. And, you know, there, there's no apostasy, there's no false conversion, there's no falling of the way, which the Bible speaks about very frequently. Um, from the Reformed point of view, it's because they came to God in and of themselves. And man can come to God in and of himself, just not rightly. We've talked about that before. And this is the issue that's at play here. So he says, yeah, this isn't our major point of contention, but it actually really is. We have a doctrine of apostasy. We have a doctrine of false conversion. And also, on the other side, a doctrine of assurance for a reason. That's because that's what the Bible talks about. Um, how does uh, Leighton Flowers uh, deal with apostasy and those kinds of issues, those very real issues that happen? From this presentation, you really want to know. And, frankly, that worries me. But you know, maybe he's dealt with that in other passages, and not in other passages, but in other videos and, and dialogues and so on and so forth. Um, but this is one area that I do know that as a whole, Southern Baptist traditionalists usually tend to be very weak on. You know, it's very much so, got your ticket punched, going to heaven, you know. I wrote down in, in my Bible the day that I got saved, I gave my heart to the Lord, and because of that, I know that I'm good, and whenever I'm not feeling you know, quite like I'm saved, you know, I can get that out and I can wave it to the devil and show him that I'm really, really, really saved. That absolutely terrifies me. Um, yes, I believe in the, the perseverance of the saints, but I also believe that, you know, we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. You know, there is a, a reason why there's a proce process of assurance uh, that goes along with it, and also why there is, you know, a sifting process as well, where we weed out uh, false converts. And false converts, well, not necessarily just us, but life in general, will weed out false converts. And there will be, it seems at least from what Jesus has to say in Matthew chapter 7 and places like that, that there will be people who, at least relatively close to the point of their death, and perhaps even coming into judgment, will say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, have we not done all of these things? Aren't we yours? And he'll say, I never knew you. Not you never knew me, but I never knew you. And Paul says something very similar in Galatians, I think it's chapter 4, somewhere around verse 9, I believe. Um, not that you know God, but that you are known by God, he says, is what is the important distinction. Uh, and that's a distinction that you have to allow for. It's a very biblical one. But as a whole, like I said, I'm not exactly sure how Leighton, uh, Dr. Leighton Flowers would deal with this. But as a whole, I've not seen Southern Baptist traditionalists really deal with that issue in any great extent. They don't really seem to have a functional doctrine of false conversion and um, 
of you might say progressive um, assurance as well. Some people progress in their assurance real quick, and of course the question is whether or not it's justified, all those kinds of things. But they don't seem to have a very fully orb doctrine when it comes to that. It's very simple. Uh, like you said, it's basically once saved, always saved is what I get from most people. I don't know if that's the case with him particularly, but for most uh, Southern Baptist traditionalists as a whole, it is that. It's once saved, always saved. You got your ticket punched, you're going to heaven. And um, I know a person in particular who likes a lot of what Southern Baptist traditionalists have to teach, but he doesn't like that part. And frankly, I agree with him. If it's that shallow, it's once saved, always saved, there is no doctrine of false conversion or anything like that, that's a major problem. Um, I wouldn't agree with him in some areas, but where he has a problem with traditionalism in this regard, I would as well. Um, for different reasons, of course, and we have different outcomes as a whole, because I do believe in the perseverance of the saints, of true saints, um, not false converts, those kinds of things. So there are distinctions in that, but we would both be concerned about telling someone that, you know, just because you said a prayer, you got your ticket punched and you're going to heaven. Um, that is a very dangerous mentality. Moving on, though. That's it's really important to understand this. In the concept of predestination, you're either, from the Calvinistic vantage point, certain individuals are predestined to believe so as to be saved, versus, traditionalist perspective, God is predestined whosoever believes to be sanctified and glorified. See the difference? Okay. Pre All right. Just wanted to jump in one more time there. Um, he's trying to lay out the difference in uh, the perspectives as to where the predestination is happening. And, um, of course, in the Reformed view, predestination occurs much uh, more so towards the beginning of everything. There's the fallen state of man, and then there's the unconditional uh, election of God. Happens pretty much right up front. In Southern Baptist traditionalism, it's, you know, there's no predestination over here. It's just after you've already made a decision, then God predetermines what he's going to do with you. He's basically predetermined that if you make this decision, he'll do this with you. And um, uh, and I think that was relatively clear from his uh, presentation. But one thing that he keeps slipping into, and lots of people who are on that side of the aisle, on the synergistic side of the aisle, fall into is they like to use this idea of whosoever believes then all this uh, will happen and they're borrowing biblical language that is true John 3.16 and other passages like that use that phrasing in English the problem though is that it doesn't have the same correspondence in Greek the original language behind it in English we usually interpret it as a condition you know whosoever believes will be saved you know if you choose to believe then you will be saved that's not the construction in Greek. In Greek, it is a hina subjunctive clause, and when that happens, it states a purpose, not a condition. It's not conditioned on faith, it's so that those with faith will be saved. It's not something that you do in and of yourself. There is no choice in the Greek construction. It's not you choosing to do this and so becoming saved. It's not in the Greek. But um, he, like a lot of people within his camp, are relying very heavily on English translation and very per and particular renderings in English translations. And of course, that's a problem when English isn't the original language of the Bible. Um, if you're going to make a, a point about doctrine in that way, um, you've got to be very careful about what you base it on. And yeah, that's not the way to do it. you got to check and actually see if your understanding of that passage in English actually matches what was originally given in the Greek. And in this case, it simply doesn't. Moving on. Destined certain individuals to believe so as to be glorified, salvation, versus God has predestined whosoever believes, whosoever's in Christ through faith, whoever's clothed in the righteous Christ. He is predestined for them to become sanctified, made holy, blameless, and adopted, salvation, glorified. Make sense? That's the two distinctions being laid out here. All right, so like I said, 
Um, he falls into that trap of relying on the English version of it, whosoever believes, thinking that it's conditional, because that's how it sounds in English, and that's actually what it is in Greek. It's not in Greek. It's a purpose clause in Greek. Um, and he rolls with it, and lots of synergists do. Um, but like I said, the Bible wasn't written in English. And so how it hits the hear, ear in English doesn't really matter. If that's not what was originally said, it's not true. A great analogy for students if you're asking this question about predestination. This is one of the funnest analogies for me to tell for students. Um, story about Coach Hobbs, after Herschel Hobbs, and Coach Calvin, Calvin and Hobbs. There you go. Coach Calvin and Coach Hobbs. They both live in um, competing cities. Both of them have their own... Um, the baseball team. Okay. Now, in Coach Calvin's league, what Coach Calvin does is he goes and he selects individually who's going to be on his team, and he is very persuasive. Matter of fact, he's so persuasive he never fails in persuading someone to come onto his team. Make sense? And so that's how his league works. He does not. He, he may send out the invitation, "Hey, everybody can come and join." But really, the only ones he really has joined are the ones he's pre-selected before the season begins. Okay? Does that make sense? And so he may put out an announcement, hey, anybody can come, whosoever comes. But really, the only ones who can come are the ones who have, he has selected to come. And he approaches them personally and invites them and persuades them irresistibly to come and be on his team. Now, in the other league, there is Coach Hobbs. Now, Coach Hobbs has a whosoever will policy. Anybody can come play on my team. I want you to come play on my team. Everybody's welcome to come play on my team. Invite anybody that you want to invite. If you're going to come, bring your friends with you. Please, I want anybody and everybody to come. And he really means it. He really wants everybody to come. Okay? Now, both coaches come to a press conference before the league has even started the season. And they both say, I have predetermined I am going to have the best conditioned, best trained team in the league. Okay? Both of them have predetermined what their team is going to become, right? And both of them can rightly say, I have predetermined what my team will become. And both of them will be saying the truthful thing. Calvin has predetermined what his team will become, even though he's pre-selected who's going to be on his team. Coach Hobbs has predetermined whosoever is on his team is going to be trained and conditioned and made into a well-trained team. Does that make sense? So there's a difference between the two leagues, but both of them are able to say before the, the season even begins, I have predetermined what's going to become of those on my team. Now, let's look at the actual text. And this is another thing that Leighton Flowers, uh, Professor Leighton Flowers, Dr. Leighton Flowers does in a lot of his materials. He picks really bad analogies that have very little to do with the Bible in order to make his points. And I don't mind people using allegories to explain things to a certain extent, but he really tends to go out there with allegories. We've already seen uh, the parable error with Dr. Leighton Flowers before, where he's pressing upon the de details of parables in the Bible in order to make theological points. Uh, here before we saw some interpretation problems uh, with how he made particular points. And here, to explain things, he's using an analogy that doesn't really apply to the biblical situation. To make it more accurate, let's say that instead of two uh, coaches uh, with competing teams, let's actually put it in within the biblical realm of the condition of man. The condition of man isn't that he's untrained and he needs to be trained. The condition of man, biblically, is that he is a sinner. It is an issue of justice, not of talent. So, to make this a little bit more biblically accurate, let's say that you have the governors of two different states. And, each, and in each state, there is a certain number of criminals who have been condemned to death row. Now, those governors can choose, if they wish to, to extend pardon to those duly convicted, rightly convicted, death-worthy criminals. On the one hand, we'll call them the Hobbes, Let's say that he decides that everyone who wants to be pardoned will be pardoned. And then once they decide that they want to be pardoned, then he'll work with them in order to make them, you know, suitable citizens for his state. On the other hand, 
there is the governor who says, no, it's not going to be whoever wants to be pardoned is going to get a pardon. Instead, I'm going to be the one who determines who gets the pardon, and I'm going to be the one who determines how everything is going to flow from there because I have a purpose in all of this. I am going to do this such that I will know for certain that this will work out for the best good of my state. One is hoping for the best good of his state. The other one has determined that this is going to be for the best good of his state. One is allowing the convicted, duly convicted criminal to be the deciding factor. The other one says duly convicted criminals don't deserve anything and I'm not going to give them that right. What I'm doing, I'm doing for the good of my state. I'm not doing it because they have anything in and of themselves that is so valuable. That is much more so akin to the biblical situation. The biblical situation is one of justice. Justice that has been violated. And we, as those violators, deserve a punishment of death. We are duly convicted death row inmates. And if you think it hits the ear a little bit weird to have... A governor saying, well, whoever wants to be pardoned can be pardoned. If that strikes, strikes you as a little bit odd, you're right, that would be odd in a just system. Now, in a just system, for grace to be grace, it cannot be conditioned upon you saying that uh, you want to have it. If anyone who wants to get out can get out, that's not really grace anymore in so much as there isn't real justice that's being done. Real justice says that the law really matters and that the punishment really matters, and that simply being sorry about it and wanting to do better isn't going to cut it. It's not, if you can get out of something just simply by wishing it away, you have perverted that system of justice. What you're saying is that the law doesn't really matter. And yeah, in both systems, you know, that that violation would be paid for by someone else to keep it biblical, by Christ. Um, but it's a very, very, very different system. One of it holds justice in a very high regard and the prisoner in a very low position. Saying prisoners don't have rights. You're a prisoner. You don't get to determine these things. The other one says... Oh, that's okay. The prisoner is basically a full citizen. If he wants to, to choose to go and mingle with the, the regular uh, citizens, you know, we'll make that available to him, you know. One upholds justice, puts the criminal in the place. The other one does not hold justice in a very high place and allows the criminal basically to become a citizen uh, without any proper distinction who he really is. And that worries me to a great extent. That's a little bit more uh, biblically accurate analogy than saying, well, it's two different coaches, you know, who've determined that they have the best trained team. And of course, if you listen to his analogy on that, you'll pretty quickly realize that only one of those coaches can actually say that with real confidence. Coach Calvin, who determined everything to begin with. He knows everyone who's out there. He knows who's going to be best for his team, whatnot, and he selects those ones. Guess what? He is the one who actually can say with confidence that he has the best tra uh, trained team. Uh, Hobbs, on the other hand, he can say that he did the best with what he had, not that he has the best team. That's a big difference. Calvin, Coach Calvin, determines everything uh, the whole way through and says he knows that this is going to be the best outcome because he made it that way. Hobbes, on the other hand, hopes that it turns out that way based on, what's he, on what he gets in. It falls a little bit flat. And then, like I said, it's also not very biblical. Okay. Governors who are deciding who to pardon on death row is much more appropriate because that's the condition of man. Okay. Whether you believe in original sin or not, the Bible requires, at the very least, that we believe that all normal human beings have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans 3. Okay. All have sinned. And that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6. We're all death row inmates. So, 
how is it that God extends pardon? Does it say, hey, if you want to be pardoned, I'll let you out. I'll work with you. Or does he say, I have a plan and a purpose in all of this, and I'm going to do this on the sheer basis of grace. You don't get to determine if you get out or not. I determine if you get out or not. Does he treat us as duly convicted criminals, or does he treat us as citizens in unfortunate circumstances? Which one is the God of the Bible? All right, moving on. Here in our final minutes, because this text here is Ephesians chapter 1, and it's probably the most referred to text when it comes to, I know that's really small writing, so I wanted to get the whole chapter up there because over the next slide, but I want you to see that in that Ephesians chapter 1, 1 through 14 is probably the most quoted text with regard to predestination especially, and the concept of even doctrinal election. But I want you to understand that in this chapter, um, the term or a form of in him is over 10 times just in this first 14 verses. All of them are highlighted there. In Christ Jesus, in him, in him, in the one, um, in Christ, in him, in Christ, in Christ, in him, God's possession. And so the key is here, the theme Paul is trying to get across is obviously you need to be in Christ, right? So what's the difference between the Calvinistic and the traditionalistic? All right, just wanted to chime in there real quick. He's about to go into one of the worst arguments I've ever heard on the basis of, at least in comparing what the person is saying versus what the original text in Greek actually means. He keeps saying, you know, it's in him, in him, in him, and what he's trying to do is build this case for corporate predestination and for corporate election and things like that. And the problem, though, is that in the Greek, when it says in him, um, that is not a, that's not necessarily a class distinction. In fact, in that particular context, that would be uh, equivalent to saying because of or by virtue of. That is, uh, let's just go ahead and see if I can pull up the text here and we can look at it that way. All right, let's start around verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Um, in the Koine Greek, that would be equivalent to saying because of Christ or by virtue of Christ. Why is it that we have these blessings? It's because of what Christ did. It's talking about Christ as cause. Just as he chose us in him, that is, the reason why he could choose us is because of the justice that was done in him, because of him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love, and so on and so forth it goes. In other words, um, what he's going to try to say about class election and class predestination, and particularly with this in him thing, has no semblance on uh, the Greek at all. None. It's just not there. Um, he keeps trying to argue uh, for it as, you know, this in Christ is this special technical thing. And, and granted, it, there is some speciality there, but you look it up in a standard Greek lexicon. Let's go ahead and just do that so you can see what I'm talking about, hopefully. Uh, do, 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 do. Need the Greek text. Okay, where's a good place? Ah, no, not that one. I know that would do. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. In Christ, there we go. In Christ, look at the N, and the applicable meaning for this particular context is down here towards uh, the bottom. Because of, on account of, by, by reason of. That's the appropriate definition uh, for this context in most of these cases. There's a few of them that are just simple positionals and things like that. But by and large, for the kind of stuff that he's talking about, that Dr. Leighton Flowers is talking about, the appropriate contextual definition is because of, by virtue of, by reason of. Um, it's not once you're in the class of. There is no in the class of in this context. Um, now, can uh, that Greek preposition n, uh, epsilon, nu, uh, have kind of the, the sphere of, uh, in which something is done? Yes, with spatial concepts. 
Christ is not a spatial concept. That's a personal concept. He's a person. At least if you're properly Trinitarian, you are. Um, it's not appropriate to translate it the way that he's trying to put it on there. It just doesn't work. In the Greek text, in context, if you, as long as you're staying within the bounds of orthodoxy, recognizing the personality of Jesus and those kinds of things, this, these statements are causative. By virtue of, because of, on account of, by reason of. The only way that he can make the arguments that he would be, if he were to be consistent, would be to go outside of the parameters of Orthodox Christianity, or basically what he's been doing up to this point is assuming that the English translation somehow trumps the Greek, which it doesn't. That's just ludicrous to pre pretend that it does. So, let's get back into this. Perspective and interpretation of this. The Calvinists believe that God has chosen a particular number of people to be in him, and he has chosen those individuals to be irresistibly made to be in him. The non-Calvinist believes that whosoever may enter in him. A good analogy for that would be an airplane. An airplane is destined to go from... All right, before we get into the airplane analogy, I wanted to just jump in here and talk about... Uh, what we've said so far concerning predestination, you know, he's, he's again trying to lay out that difference of, you know, we, we Southern Baptist traditionalists, we believe that we're in, uh, in him, you know, after we make the choice. We're predestined in him after we make the choice. But the problem with that is that that is not what the Bible actually teaches. Let's go ahead and look that up here. Do, 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 do. Let's bring up Romans. 8 and verse 30. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What's that about? Very simple. In the text of Romans, which granted is not Ephesians, um, but I'm just pointing out that this is very clear, that predestination precedes the call. That is, before we are called to be Christians, we are predestined. What Leighton Flowers is saying, what Dr. Leighton Flowers is saying, is he's saying that um, we are called first, we respond to that call, and then we're predestined towards sanctification. That's the argument that he's making. But the problem is, that's not the order that the Bible puts it in. Like I said before. What does it say? And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The biblical order puts the predestination first and then the call. Dr. Leighton Flowers is arguing that predestination happens after the call. After you respond to the call, then you're predestined to this particular end. That's not the order that the Bible puts it in. That's why Reformed people don't believe it. Because that's not what the Bible says. So he does a good a good job of explaining the two different points of view. The only problem is that the point of view he's espousing is not supported in the text. He mangles the text of Ephesians into something that is not contextually appropriate at all. And then he puts forward this view that is actually directly contrary to what is said over in Romans. Um, yeah, not so good. That's okay, but let's go ahead and uh, listen to his airplane analogy. That'll fix everything, I'm sure, because his analogies are always spot on. Not really. He tries, though. He does try, and a lot of his analogies people get, they can see, they're, they're good that way. The only problem is they're just not very accurate. Two coaches, you know, that's, that's what God is trying to do. He's just trying to form a really great team. Um, that's not quite the issue, but let's see about the airplane analogy. From Dallas to New York tomorrow at noon, okay? Whosoever can enter into that plane, but the destination has already been preset. Does that make sense? So whoever gets on that plane is going, their destination is predetermined. They're going there. You're predestined to become, you're predestined to the destination. So whosoever's in the plane will become this. The Calvinist would say the plane's not only destined, but whoever gets on the plane is destined as well. But does the text say that? When, what, what happens? How do all right, so that was his wonderful airplane analogy. You know, there's this plane, 
and the uh, destination is picked out. It's going to be New York or Paris, France, or whatever it happens uh, to be. The destination is preset, but whoever uh, wants to can get on the plane. I'll just point out here that I've never seen an airline that worked that way. Every airline that I've been on, and granted I haven't been on too many, but every airline that I've been on always knew who the passengers were going to be up front. They had these things called tickets that they would give you. And it wasn't whosoever will. Instead, they wanted to know up front who was going to be on and who wasn't, so it wouldn't be overloaded and things like that. Um, you know, having people not show up was okay, um, but having too many people show up would not be okay, you know. Um, Airlines don't really work that way. So I understand what he's trying to say, but it's just really not an appropriate analogy at all. Like, like at all. Like at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that would be the difference between the two groups, between a, re a reform position and Southern Baptist traditionalism. Anyone who wants to can get on the plane is the Southern Baptist traditionalist uh, point of view. And from a reform uh, perspective, we're saying that whoever, um, you can uh, justifiably say to anyone that, you know, whoever uh, believes uh, with a true saving faith will indeed be saved. We can say that with full confidence. The only difference is that we recognize that saving faith is a gift of God. That's what it says in Ephesians 2.8, for example. You know, this not of yourselves, this is the gift of God. Uh, I think we've discussed that before in the video uh, series when it says that this there, um, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, depending on the translation you're looking at. Those are what are called ambiguous reference. Uh, the uh, genders do not match up with what came previously in the verse, which means it's encompassing everything. So the grace, the faith, the sal salvation in Ephesians 2.8, all of it is considered the gift of God, grammatically speaking. And that's why Reformed people believe what they do about that. Faith is a gift of God, as is the grace of God, as is salvation in, in a general sense. Um, it's all the gift of God. We're just staying with what Scripture says. But Dr. Leighton Flowers really likes his analogies, like airlines that don't have tickets. All right, moving on. How do we get to be in Christ? That's ultimately the question of this debate. How do we get to be in Him? We'll look at verse 13. It says, You also were included in Christ when? When before the foundation of the world you were included in Christ. Is that what it says? When you heard the message of truth. Remember the power of the gospel that we talked about? When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in Him. So were you in Him before you believed or after you believed? After, when you believed, you were marked in Him. So you are not placed in Him, you are not chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Those who are in Him are chosen to become holy and blameless. If you look back at the text. Look, look, look. All right, jump in here before we get too far. This is a case where, again, he goes with English translation as his basis, and in this case, not a particularly good one. Here, the NIV, which is what he's basing it on, basically stands alone. Let me show you what I mean. All right, so here is the NIV. And it says, And you are included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. The problem, though, is that that's not what the Greek text says. In the Greek text... It doesn't say that you were included in Christ when you heard the message of salvation. That's what the English text of the NIV says, but that's not what the Greek text says. And you can read it in a lot of other translations that won't say it that way. For example, uh, this is NASB. This is a much more accurate translation. We'll read what it has to say. It says, In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed... You were sealed in him with uh, the whole a spirit of promise. Do you notice the difference? The NASB is much more clear about the grammatical construction here. You have in him, and then you have these commas separating these additional phrases. So if you take out all the additional phrases, the in him is actually 
corresponds to this part down here. So you have in him, skip all the additional phrases, and you have you were sealed. In him you were sealed, in him with a, a Holy Spirit of promise. That's the actual grammatical construction. NASB does a very good job of rendering it. It's a complicated structure, but that is accurate. In him, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, is what the actual main clause there is. And that is why in other translations, even the ones that use the, the when, um, like here, here's the Net Bible, it says, And when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't say that you were marked in him. It says that you were marked with the Holy Spirit at that point. So it doesn't say that you were included in him when you believed. That's something that is individual to the NIV. The NIV says when you believed you are marked in him with a seal. No other translation will do it that way, though. At least no other major fairly formal translation does it that way. Uh, HCSB over here. When you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were also sealed with the Holy, uh, the promised Holy Spirit. It doesn't have uh, the in him because it recognizes that the in him is basically a subclass. The in him actually is not core to the meaning of the passage at all, and it recognizes that it's attached to something else. It gets really convoluted, so HCSB basically takes it out. And then over here is the ESV. In him you also, when you heard uh, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Again, the in him you also is attached to, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. It is not connected to the time of hearing the gospel and accepting the gospel. It's not there in the Greek. And because of that, a lot of translations don't put it there. The NIV is the one that doesn't, and frankly, it is the oddball in that one. Um, very much so a synergistic bias in that translation that you do not find in other translations, and especially the more formal ones. Uh, if it wasn't for that translation, if he had been trying to use another translation other than the NIV, and especially the more formal ones, he would not have been able to make this point. When the point that you use you can only make from a certain translation. You cannot make it from the original text, and you cannot also make it from more formal translations. Then it's probably not a good point. It's probably wrong. Okay. The reason why the NIV does this is because the NIV is dynamic. It kind of plays a little bit fast and loose. It's not meant to be doctrinally precise. It's meant to get general meanings across. Unfortunately, in this case, it got a specific meaning across that was incorrect. And that is always the danger of a dynamic translation. Dynamic tr translations are meant for the general, but they often include specifics. But the specifics are not going to be as accurate because it's a dynamic translation. And that is exactly what Dr. Leighton Flowers is relying on. And this is why I have a hard time honestly calling him doctor now. Of course I do. I recognize that there was effort that went into this. He is a professor, those kinds of things. But frankly, there was a day and an age where if you had a doctorate in something, it meant that you studied it out thoroughly. And you would be aware of differences like this. And conscience-wise, for the sake of your profession, for the sake of maintaining the integrity of that doctorate, you wouldn't do something like this. Other people would shut you down in a heartbeat. The people who are around you, who are even on your side of the issue, would say, you can't do that. That is not professionally, academically honest. That's not the case anymore. Instead, you have the selective usage of sources. I want to use an English translation, and I'm going to use the English translation that is outside of the norm of all of the others, and which there is no basis in the original grammar for it, etc., etc. And he's allowed to do this by his own peers, on his side. And that shouldn't be. That should not be. Look what it says up in verse 4. He chose us in him, those who believe, those who believe the gospel, before the creation of the world, to be what? To be saved? To become believers? No. To be holy and blameless. That's sanctification. You see what I'm saying? So you're predestined to become holy and blameless. Well, what else does it say? 
All right, um, just quickly pointing this out here. Um, this is where Dr. Layton flowers. I know that he doesn't believe this personally, but if you were to take what he says consistently to its logical end, you'd basically wind up with Roman Catholicism as far as the basic soteriology would be concerned. Um, well, maybe not Roman Catholicism per se, but definitely sinless perfectionism. Uh, let's look at the text here real quick. So we have Ephesians 1. I'll just do the whole thing. And he says in verse 4 is where the key difference is. All right, so let's look here. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. And then it goes on into the next verse. The in love is connected to the, the next verse there. And Dr. Leighton Flowers is uh, arguing that this, this, whole, uh, this holiness, this blamelessness is sanctification. You know, it's not talking about salvation. It's talking about sanctification. Um, no, it's not. When it says that he chose us to be holy and blameless in him, that's not sanctification, because I guarantee you this. In your life of sanctification, you will never be holy and blameless. Okay, not unless you're a sinless perfectionist, but that's outside the realm of orthodox Protestantism. Um, like I said, if you take what Leighton Flowers is saying here seriously, and you really believe that the outcome of your life here on earth is that you will be holy and blameless before God, because that's what that passage is talking about, it is clear here. Yeah, holy and blameless before him. If you believe that the outcome of your salvation here on earth is that you will be holy and blameless before God, you will be able to stand in his presence being holy and righteous as a result of your sanctification, that you have finally achieved the point where you're perfect in this life and therefore can stand in the judgment before the judgment seat, you are a heretic. That is called sinless perfectionism. It is outside the realm of orthodox Protestantism. It is a heresy of the highest order. It is completely contrary to the Bible. What is it that the Apostle John says in his gospel? If we claim to have no sin, we make him out to be a liar. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. That's what it says right there in the first chapter of 1 John. There is no such thing as sinless perfectionism. Yes, we do go through a practice, uh, practice of sanctification, which means we are set apart. That's what it means to sanctify something. It is set apart. We are set apart from the world, and our attributes become less like the world and more like God's. But we are never going to achieve a position where we are truly holy and blameless before God in this life. That's not what it's talking about. And you read on in the context, and it becomes really clear that that's not what it's talking about. Let me show you what I mean. All right, so we read on from there. He predestined us to the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Verse 7 there is the one that I wanted to bring you guys to. This is the context that follows, you know, verses 4 and 5 that he's talking about. He doesn't go on to verse 7 and say and realize that this is connected to what was just talked about. When it says in those previous verses that we are in him able to be holy and blameless, what does it mean? How, how, how is that achieved? Well, it tells us in verse 7. It's because in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. That's justification. That is uh, being made right hand before God, that is not the practice of uh, sanctification. That is justification. In him, we have justification. In him, we are made right before God. That's not the practice of, uh, the, that's not the process of sanctification. It is not the same thing at all. Um, Dr. Leighton Flowers, like I said, if you were consistent in this and actually took this to its logical end, he would be a sinless perfectionist and he would be outside of the realm of Protestant orthodoxy. Now, I know, at least as far as I can tell from online things and whatnot and what he said, he doesn't believe in sinless perfectionism. Great. I'm, I'm glad that I can still call him a brother instead of having to rebuke him as a heretic and as an apostate. I'm very happy about that. 
But the problem is that what he just argued is would lead to that. Because that's what he's saying. He chose us in him to be holy and blameless as sanctification. In sanctification, you will never be holy and blameless. It's only in justification that we can be holy and blameless. That is, we're justified in him, in Christ. It is by Christ that we are holy and blameless before God, not of ourselves. No matter how much sanctification we undergo, we will never be holy and blameless before God. Never, ever, 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 ever. And if you believe that, like I said, you're a heretic. That's basically what Slayton Flower said, but like at the same time, I know he's not consistent in that one. At least as far as I can tell, he's not consistent in that one. Um, but yeah, if anyone actually listened to what he was saying here and took it to its logical conclusion, he'd be leading them into heresy. He himself might not be a heretic, but if they were to take his word seriously and consistently, they would. And because of that, I have to jump in here and say, no, that's wrong. That's not, that's not an appropriate uh, interpretation of that passage. It doesn't match what we know about sanctification in the first place. Sanctification in and of itself does not make you whole and holy and blameless before God. No matter how much sanctification you undergo, you will never be able to stand in God's presence as holy and blameless. That is only through justification. That is only through the imputed righteousness of Christ given to you and your sins being imputed to Christ. That is the only way you can stand right, holy, pure, and blameless before God. It has nothing to do with sanctification. Okay, sanctification is something that is going to vary from person to person. Okay, people are not have will not achieve the same level of sanctification at the end of their life. Um, you're just not guaranteed that, but we are expected to progress in sanctification as life goes on. That is very, very true and a very important doctrine. But sinless perfectionism, to say that sanctification means that you will be holy and blameless as a result of this, that is an error. And that's actually an error that even occurs within Calvinism, unfortunately. Um, one of the the, uh, the superstars of the Calvinistic world is John Piper. And John Piper, in one of his sermons uh, and teachings as a whole, he has said that uh, justification is not the same thing as getting into heaven. He's said that what happens is, you know, you're you're first put into a position of being in favor with God uh, by justification, and then your works get you into heaven. Your personal holiness, your personal sanctification, gets you into heaven. That is outright heresy. Now. How consistent John Piper is on that or not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but that is what he has said. Now, is that what he meant? We could argue that all day long. At the very best, he's ambiguous and unclear, and if people took what he said to its logical conclusion, you would re have the result of basically a, a system of work salvation. It's not quite the same as what would consistently result from latent flowers here. Latent flowers would be sinless perfectionism. Um, what John Piper is putting forward is basically a, a system of synergistic works, not just um, a synergism in the sense of assenting to God's grace, which is what um, you know Armenian Southern Baptist traditionalists believe in, but I'm saying in the Catholic sense, where you're actually working alongside uh, God. He is doing his work, and you're working in a way that actually meaningfully contributes to your salvation. Your salvation is ultimately contingent, at least in part, on your works. That is outside of the realm of Protestant orthodoxy. And like I said, I'm not sure within himself how consistent uh, John Piper is with that. So I can't necessarily um, profess to know his, his eternal state on that basis or where he stands with God on that basis. But I do know that if someone takes his word seriously, um, they're going to basically be embracing the Roman Catholic system of semi pelagianism And if people embrace what Leighton Flowers is saying consistently, they will be embracing the position of sinless perfectionism, which is also heretical, extremely dangerous, and outside of Protestant orthodoxy. All right, let's get back into this. On down, it says that in accordance with the pleasure of his will, the praise of his glorious grace, he's freely given us in the one. In him we have been 
uh, the redemption through his blood, in him we were also chosen, verse 11, having been predestined to what? According to the plan of him who works out everything in the conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who? Put our hope in Christ. Put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. Now, it's important that the adoption that he's talking about, which is the verse I was looking for, okay, in him he predestined us for adoption. Now, what's adoption? Romans chapter 8. If you turn to Romans chapter 8, it says we eagerly wait for the redemption of our bodies, the adoption as sons. You are not fully adopted until you take residence with the person who adopted you. Right? Paul's idea of adoption was a future hope, something we're looking forward to. And how do you know you're going to get it? He's predestined you for it. And he's sealed you with the Holy Spirit promise. That's what that's what perseverance is all about, that he's marked us as God's possession with the promised Holy Spirit. He is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. And so we know we will stay in him because he has given us the Spirit as a mark, as a guarantee to hold us in him until the day of redemption. So the reason we have perseverance, the reason we have this concept is the very concept of predestination. So predestination, from our perspective, is not about God choosing certain individuals and predetermining them to be, be become believers in order to predetermine them to be a, adopted. No, he has predetermined whosoever is in him through faith, their own responsibility, to become holy and blameless, sanctified, and to be adopted, which is the final glorification process when we take residence. Make sense? No. <laughs> um, and this is, again, where he relies very heavily on English translation and shows pretty much no concern for the original languages. He's made a number of bad arguments on that basis. You know, the whole in him thing, which is not actually accurate to what the Greek text there means. It actually means by virtue of, because of. Um, it has nothing to do with a class because Jesus is not a class marker. Jesus is personal. He is an agent. He is the agent of our salvation. It's because of him that all these things happen, so on and so forth. Atrocious use of original sources and original texts, and there is really no use of original uh, texts here. And it goes to translations that stand on their own, that have no basis in the Greek whatsoever, like uh, the NIV at Ephesians 1.13. There is no basis for that translation. Um, whatsoever. And then here he brings up the issue of adoption, and he claims that adoption is the final end process. And again, he's missing a major component of what is actually going on in the Greek here. Let's look it up. All right, so let's see here. Back in verse 5, it says, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. And then he brings up the issue with uh, Romans 8. But let's look up that word. And do, 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 do. where is it here? Do, 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 do. 7, we don't need 7. 5, there we go, 5. Here we are. Okay, this particular word that gets translated as adoption, I don't think he looked this up, but if you look it up in uh, a decent lexicon, you're going to see that, of course, like most words, it has multiple meanings, and it has, indeed, three meanings that are separate and distinct. First meaning, of God's acceptance of the nation of Israel as his chosen people. Um, I think we can all agree that Ephesians chapter 1 is not dealing with the nation of Israel per se. That is probably not the one that's appropriate. Can we agree on that? Hopefully we can. Two, of the sonship status bestowed on those who believe in Christ. All right, on the sonship status bestowed on those who believe in Christ. That actually is the one that is applicable to Ephesians. But what does he do for his example of showing it as being the final state? He goes to Romans 8, and guess what the definition in Romans 8 is? It's of the sta uh, status given in the resurrected state. Those are two different uses of the word. One is of a final state, but the other one is one that is coincidence 
with him believing in Christ. It's not an eventual state. Two is the one that's actually appropriate to the context. Because that is what is actually in the context. Is belief not the... Uh, is uh, belief in Christ. That's the only thing that you see in the immediate uh, context there. You don't have an eventual end goal where it clearly says that this is the end. It's just not there. It's just not there. Um, that word has three different meanings. The one that applies in Ephesians is not the eventual end of the resurrected state. That is not its context. Its context is in that of being holy and blameless before God, which is done through the redemption of Christ's blood, uh, by which we are justified, not sanctified, justified. That's the only way we can stand before a holy and righteous God. Okay, Our sanctification, no matter how far we progress in our sanctification, is never going to be good enough for that. Uh, and it is in that context that that word is brought up which is the same context that is over there in Galatians 4.5, if you saw the reference on it. Um, Romans 8.23 is a completely different context. And in that case, it is talking about uh, something that happens in the resurrected state. But what has Leighton Flowers done is he's conflated the two. You look up a decent lexicon like we did, and it's going to say these are different. But Leighton Flowers doesn't do that. Instead, he relies heavily on English translation, bad English translation in a few cases, on his own very faulted understanding, does not show any great awareness of how the original language works in those kinds of concerns, or even bothers to look up the word and see that it has multiple definitions and that it might, at the very least, might not actually apply to this particular text. Um, like I said, I, I affirm Dr. Layton Flowers as a brother in the Lord, a very inconsistent brother in the Lord, but I affirm him as a brother in the Lord, but I do not respect him as a scholar. A scholar who actually was worthy of the title doctor would actually bother to look this stuff up. I don't have a doctorate. I used to be a teacher, that much is true, but I don't have a doctorate, and I even know better than that. How is it that he got all the way to that level and did not know that you're supposed to look up words before you use them? and make sure that they're being applied contextual, in a contextually appropriate ways, that you do not rely on English translation over an original text if translation is going to be an issue, etc., etc. How could he possibly get to this state without knowing those basic things? That was either very, very, very poor training, in which case he sh should not be teaching, or he is willfully ignoring those aspects of good scholarship either case, there's no reason to respect his scholarship. He either is a poorly trained scholar, and you don't respect poorly trained scholars. They don't know what they're talking about. Or, he is a willingly defiant scholar. He willingly defies the standards of good scholarship. And that certainly is not worth respect either. Which one it is, it's probably actually a little bit of a mixture of both. I don't think that he you know, seriously considers what the other side has to say from folks like myself and such not. So part of it is ignoring what others have to say. And then the other part of it is, you know, in his training and those kinds of things and the particular college that he's a part of and those kinds of things, um, I think that they really didn't want him to get into those kinds of things so that he could be their token guy defending their position in a lot of ways. And that kind of became his overall position. So I think it's kind of a mixture of the both. And because of that, I'm a little bit more lenient with him than I would be if it was otherwise, you know, if it was purely him violating the standards of uh, good scholarship that he knows, frankly, I probably wouldn't even be bothering to do this video series review. Uh, because if someone is going to, if there's no hope that they'll engage in good scholarship, at least in the future, and realize their error, there's not really any point in interacting with him, except for just for the, the benefit of people who would hear his stuff and saying, yeah, he's wrong, and letting people know that there's an issue there. Uh, but what I'm really hoping is that he eventually stumbles upon these videos and realizes that you know other people are looking at his character in this. It's not just an issue of Arminianism versus Calvinism. This is how do we treat the Word of God? Do we treat it in 
a respectable manner, in a, in, in a scholarly manner, in a manner that is worthy of a scholar, who is in a manner that is worthy of someone who has taken on the title doctor. I don't believe that he is. And I know that's a serious accusation in scholarship. It is. But what we've seen here hasn't been any different from that. Total disregard for the original language, overemphasis on one particular translation, the NIV, even where it stands apart from other uh, translations, very much so apart from other translations, no justification for that given, um, complete ignorance of context, and then, like I said, not being very sensitive to what would put him within Orthodox Protestantism and not. Um, like I said, if you want to take the idea that the holiness and the blamelessness that it is talking about there is sanctification, that's sinless perfectionism. That's heresy. That's not inside the realm of Orthodox Protestantism. I don't believe that he would espouse sinless perfectionism, but if you were to be consistent in how he interpreted that passage in Ephesians 1, that's what it would lead you to. Nothing about what uh, Dr. Leighton Flowers does is actually consistent or appropriate for scholarship. He uses all these analogies that stick with people, and people remember them. That's great, fun, wonderful. But they're not really biblically appropriate. You know, we talk about coaches for sports teams when the issue that is at play in the Bible is one of justice. And justice that has been violated. Just laws that have been violated. Um, yeah, his analogy is not appropriate to that at all. If it were to be appropriate, you'd have one governor saying, hey, anyone who wants a pardon can have one, versus the governor who says, no, I'm going to determine who gets the pardon because I have a purpose in this and I'm working for the good of my state, not for the good of the prisoner. Very different <laughs> point of view on those. Um, that would be a much more appropriate one, but he doesn't do that. He avoids the good ones. And then he also uses an analogy that is just completely off the wall. You know, the destination of the airplane is picked, but not the passengers. What airline are you flying on? You can just show up and, and they'll take you. I, I would love to know. I really would. If that airline exists, I want to know about it. I Maybe I don't want to go on that one. I, I don't know. But um, that's not really an example in reality. There's problems with that. Um Again, a lot of it has to do, it's just off the wall. I'm not saying that, you know, in the broad spectrum of possibility, you couldn't do it that way. It's just off the wall and weird. And he likes to explain things through analogy rather than actually carefully going through scripture. And even when he brings up lots of scripture, like all the, the verses in Ephesians 1, he does not interpret them contextually, appropriate to the original language, all those things. Just so many problems with his scholarship. And yet there are so many people that hang on his every word. Is he a nice enough guy? Probably. And like I said, as long as he's actually not consistent in what he believes and he doesn't fall into sinless perfectionism and all these other things, I can affirm him as a brother in Christ. But as a scholar, he does not have my respect. He does not treat the Bible well. And because of that, he should not be listened to. Find men who treat the Bible with due respect, who are very careful to make seem, ensure that things are contextually appropriate, to actually look up definitions and see if defi different definitions apply. That's kind of a big thing. Um, and all those kinds of things. I don't see that with Dr. Leighton Flowers. And if he or any of his proponents would want to convince me otherwise, they're going to have to show me that they can be concerned about duly and properly interpreting the text of the Bible, uh, you know, because so far I haven't seen it. Okay, I am not a Calvinist because I love the five doctrines of grace or the Reformed confessions, etc., etc. I am a Calvinist first and foremost because of my view of how Scripture should be treated with due reverence and respect and with great care and attention. And I do not see that from the other side. All right, I've rambled on enough. Thank you very much for listening. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you come to a true understanding of the genuine Christ of history, the only real Savior of mankind. Amen.